Hey everyone, it's Gordon Einstein, your semi-favorite uh, Dubai crypto attorney, and I'm continuing my series of fast-moving interviews with the people I find the most interesting in this area, the ones who I know who are cutting edge and are willing to take the time, which I'm very grateful for. So I want to welcome onto the show Saeed Aldermaki. Uh, Saeed, thank you for making the time, and how are you tonight? Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Gordon. Um, very good. Now that I've broken my fast for the day. Yes, and we're um, going to talk about that. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Sure. Uh, so sure. Let's, let's let's do this in three phases. We just talked about this, but just to repeat for the audience so they know what's coming. I want to provide a number one an introduction to yourself. Please don't be modest because I you know people want to know what you're up to and what's <laughs> going on. Let's actually talk about Ramadan and Iftar and Suhar. Suhar. I don't actually understand all this, and I know you're practicing. I'd love to get the, sort of the insider scoop yes. on it. And then let's talk at the very end about Shisha Finance and other projects to work on. Does that sound good? Sure. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. All I right. So tell us about you. Yeah. My name is Saeed Al Darmaki. I've uh, been a crypto investor, entrepreneur, advisor, director for the past seven years. Um, I got into the crypto space when I co founded. Um, the first regulated uh, early stage VC, crypto VC fund in the UAE. Interesting. Uh, the name of that fund is Alphabet with an I, not an E. Um, okay. Before that, before I got into the space, I used to work in Abu Dhabi Investment Authority for nine years. I was in the fixed income and treasury department and um, uh, I had a very good understanding of all the asset classes out there. And when I got introduced to uh, Bitcoin and crypto back at the end of 2016 by my uh, co-founder and partner, Liam Robertson from Alphabet, mm -hmm. and for me, when I looked at Bitcoin and the fundamentals of Bitcoin, I understood back then that this was the future and this is, this is something that can really um, have a positive impact on a lot of people. And it's also an asset class, which is very different to other classes. Perhaps the only similar kind of asset class to Bitcoin would be gold. Yes. Um, and I see Bitcoin as digital gold and I see the case for Bitcoin being called uh, digital gold. Um, but yeah, I mean, traditional finance background, um, end of 2016, I sold all my personal assets, put it all into Bitcoin. And then from Bitcoin, I started angel investing in a lot of crypto startups. That was we were in the process. I'm sorry, am I hearing this correctly? You were much smarter than I was. In 2000, 2016, you sold everything and bought Bitcoin? Yes, sir. <laughs> similar similar to what Bro. CZ did, right? Yeah. Okay. That, I know that's what CZ like did. It, 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 it kind of makes me a little bit jealous, but that's okay. But you're friends. So I'm happy for you, but it was like, oh my God. Wow, yeah. were you married then? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and you got away was, with that? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, my wife has her own assets that she has, so she's she trusts me. <laughs> okay. And uh, and uh, you know, uh, my uh, family uh, believed in it, and they believed in me. Yeah. They believed in me. They didn't believe in. I don't know if they believed in Bitcoin at the time or crypto, but they believed in me, and okay. and that you know. I was smart enough to figure out what was what was the trend and what was the future of of money as we know it and um, and here here was a technology blockchain technology which was disrupting um, one of the biggest industries in the world which is the financial services industry and that was the industry that I was in so I understood that um, this was a disruptive asset class a disruptive technology and it's the future and uh, you know you don't uh, if you don't take a risk and you um, you don't believe in something and you don't really go for it and you're not passionate about it then um, you're not going to get the rewards that come with it so plus what are you doing when i, uh, when I left okay. when i left adia back in uh, june 2018 um, most of the people most of the people that i used to work with they they all thought i was crazy and um, they were telling me why are you leaving one of the most secure and best paid jobs in the world to go into something that's not proven and uh, and uh, not really many people believe in, and I said I believe in it and I know that it's the future and and it's interesting to see that the change of mindset uh, from back then 
nowadays most of those guys and and gals that uh, thought I was crazy they they think they know that I did the right thing and um and they all called on their fourth first point of call to ask about crypto and blockchain and bitcoin and um happy to support people and uh, for the past seven years in the space, I've been amazed by the level of innovation and uh, creativity and people that are coming into the space. I think the smartest people from the other industries, especially the financial services industries, are moving into the space. And it's here to stay. And I think um, with the Bitcoin ETF, um, well, uh, taking a lot of traction now Fine. and the institutions taking a lot of interest in it. I think um, it's only going to grow from here and there's going to be much more involvement, especially from institutions in this space, which is something that I always believed needed to happen. All right, there, there, there's a lot to unpack there. Let, let me ask you a few things. So what, what's your educational background? So I uh, studied in an international private school. I studied the British system. Mm -hmm. uh, I graduated from school in 99. Um, I went to a university in London called uh, Kingston University. I studied statistics with business management. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I got married in the UK. I had my first two kids, uh, two boys in the UK. Um, so I lived in the UK from 99 till 2009. And then I moved back to the UAE. And um, when I moved back, I went into Adia and uh, since then, I've been fully focused on the blockchain and crypto space. And do the do any of your ex coworkers, in addition to calling you up for guidance, do they ever do you ever have that sweet moment where they say, you know what, you were right? I, yeah, I mean, I don't really. I mean, I'm not saying you're looking that. for that, but it, it'd be nice. It'd be yeah. nice if they have. I wonder if those, if those. No, it's always great. It's always great to see that there is interest from people that were doubters before. Mm -hmm. It's good, for sure. I, I'm I'm happy to hear them ask me about it, and I never, um, and I tell them I told you so, or you know, kind of. Uh, I'm not saying you're gloating. I'm just wondering it. whether it's happening. Is you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I was curious. Um, so, do you have any? I know you have an investment background. Do you ever have a mixed feelings about the institutions going to this? And is it in any way antithetical to the original vibe and purpose of at least Bitcoin? Or how do you, do you reconcile that? Um, do you have to reconcile that? I mean, uh, basically, Bitcoin is a decentralized uh, blockchain network and um, crypto is very decentralized. And most of the people who have been early adopters of Bitcoin and crypto believe that everything should be decentralized. But I think in this real world, I think there should be a, a healthy balance of decentralization and centralization. There's always going to be a need for um, large institutions or central banks or governments to make decisions for a country and, and for people. Um, but also there are people out there who want to make their own choices. And here is a technology and an asset class which allows them to do so. Yes, you know, so I think, and, and I think institutions coming in is a good thing in general, but there are there are reasons for people to be concerned and so on. But I think overall is positive for the industry and positive for the space. It's definitely positive for the price, and the price drives interest and investment and improvements. So for sure, that's great. The, um, I don't know. I, I I just personally have mixed feelings about it because when I I. I would stop practicing law, which is a very centralized area, and then discovered blockchain and crypto, and then went back into law to work on performing law based on blockchain principles. Because I, I think that yeah. there's a lot of inefficiencies. You know, the, the reason I'm here, just share something personal, the reason I'm here in Dubai is to pursue the reform of law through blockchain and crypto. And it's interesting to see the interplay between the incumbents and the revolutionaries. And, you know, I, I'm not, a, I'm not wild on either side. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a perfect blend. It, it, it sounds like you're kind of on the same track. You have, a, you have an investment background, you have an institutional background, but you some, something about this technology caught your attention and kind of caught fire in your soul. And yeah, 
you, you, you absolutely. must like I think I think I think the reason the reason why blockchain technology has disrupted the financial services industry is because that industry has a lot of inefficiencies in all the legacy systems that that right. has been around for a long time and blockchain technology actually brings about a lot of efficiencies in a lot of activities and processes within the industry so there is a reason why blockchain technology is actually there to stay and is actually useful especially to institutions i think the institutions that embrace the technology and use it the most will be the ones that kind of have the most efficiencies and cut their costs and see more profitability and and more positive impact in what they do nice i like it okay let, let's shift gears um this is not the normal topic for the show but i'm going to take advantage of the fact that you kindly made yourself available explain ramadan explain to me like i'm five years old and i just landed off a plane so ramadan is a holy month that uh, muslims um, fast for 30 days and um, every day the fasting period starts from the crack of dawn which is usually like an hour or so before sunrise mm -hmm. and uh, the fast ends at sunset and um, so every day for 30 days um once once that those that period starts you can't have any liquid you can't have any water you can't eat any food and you can't really ingest anything into your body and mm. um, for that period of time and it's it's a special month especially in the uae where we are mm. and a lot of people celebrate the month and um, and i think uh, the significance of fasting has impacts in terms of health and also in terms of spirituality because if you do fast for 30 days it's actually scientifically proven out there that the white blood cell count in your in your system doubles and, and it's more than what you would have if you didn't fast for 30 days in a year. So it's, it's good for your immune system. Um, it has a lot of benefits. Usually also when you fast for 30 days, because your body doesn't have um, the energy that it needs usually, especially towards the end of the fast, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 um, if you have any kind of um, bad cells in your body, they get, they get used up and eaten up by other cells. So I, I that means you. if you have scars, if you have scars, mm -hmm. usually in some cases, people, those scars reduce over time if they've been fasting regularly for many years. So there's there's health benefits to it. But also, I think the most important thing is that fasting for 30 days without any water and food and liquid is, is extremely hard. So I think it teaches people the hardship of what many, many people in the world they don't have access to food. They don't have access to water whenever they want it or whenever they're hungry or whenever they're thirsty. Mm -hmm. And we are privileged to be in that situation. So it gives us a perspective on the people out there that don't get to eat and drink whenever they want to. And it, it teaches us an important lesson and it teaches you discipline and kind of, you know, and a lot of positive um, spiritual things. So I think... It's an important month. It's a celebrated month, and and uh, I really enjoy participating. How do you feel in the moment when you're fasting? When you're fasting, you're kind of feeling, oh my gosh, I'm so thirsty, I'm so hungry, and then as you get nearer to breaking the fast time, when you actually get to break your fast with water and dates and food, that food and that water tastes all the more sweeter and it's kind of like you know and especially towards the end of the month when it's eid and people celebrate the end of ramadan mm -hmm. then you go back to your normal routine of eating and drinking and you understand how you know how difficult it was to actually maintain the fast and actually stick with it because it's very tough mentally too not just physically do you so the, the, let me kind of repeat this back to make sure I got it. So the, the fasting period in the day is like first light, really, not when the sun is above. Yes. First light. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. I didn't know that. And But then the termination of the fast is actually sunset. Is that correct? Yes. That's okay. Correct. Yes. Interesting. And then the traditional way that you break your fast is with dates and water. So something light, I guess, to kind of get your... Yeah, dates, dates and water. 
um, and then you kind of have a light light snack um, and then you go on to a main meal kind of an hour after your breakfast. That's usually the best way to do it because your digestive system has been off for a long period. And if you kind of start just gobbling away at your food and drink and stuffing yourself, it's not really good for your digestive system. So I know most people tend to eat and drink a lot as soon as they break their fast, but I tend to take it slower and just space it out. And I feel it's much better on your stomach that way. It's funny. Last Friday, I sort of innocently, given my ignorance, hosted an iftar. And it was <laughs> the, 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 the moment the prayers were done, everyone went to the buffet. And believe me, there was no gentle end of that fast. They just went on it <laughs> big time. But usually if you're going to a buffet somewhere, then usually, you know, you have to just make use of it. But I, but usually people like cram it all in at the beginning of the buffet. Mm -hmm. But I space myself and I stay longer in the buffet. So I would stay two, three hours instead of just having all the food that I want in an hour. I'd have it over two or three hours and it works out. Now, is is, is iftar the meal, the ceremony? What, 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 iftar, the iftar is the actual breaking of the fast. Okay. That's the term that's used to break fast. Okay. Interesting. And, and, and the prayer that happens at sunset is... That's the sunset prayer, which is which happens every day. Okay. Either even when it's not Ramadan, the sunset there's a sunset prayer every day that happens anyway. Okay, so, so the, that, that happens that, to that be as the a time. normal sunset prayer just happening at Ramadan and letting you know yeah. that the the fasting portion of the day. It's is time over. to break your fast. Yes, when you hear the call to the prayer, then you know that you can break your fast. Okay, interesting. And then um, explain the suhoor. Suhoor is, um, usually suhoor is the last meal that you have before you start fasting. Mm -hmm. um, but also some people refer to it as the second meal that you have after iftar. Like you have your main meal when you break fast. Okay. And then the second meal that you would have is kind of like, I don't know, like 11 or midnight or halfway through when you break and fast and when you're going to start fasting. I, well, I it's kind of like you can you can say it's the the last half of fasting basically, and that meal that happens then. Okay, and is that usually the same sort of thing as iftar, just later, or is it a different cuisine? Um, um, usually, it's people usually have it at home, um, and it's a kind of a it's a kind of like any any kind of think about it as a lunch meal if you like. Mm -hmm. So dinner is like when you break fast and then your kind of breakfast or your lunches um, before you start fasting. And that's called suhoor. Um, but if you eat out, then sometimes there's a buffet. Sometimes they serve food on a table and everybody just grabs what they want to eat. It just depends. Interesting. And then what is your sleep schedule during Ramadan? Um, my personal sleep schedule is I kind of sleep later. And, and wake up later. Um, but usually my sleep schedule is early sleep, early wake. Um, but in Ramadan, I just kind of push it forward a few hours, if you like. Got it. And the, do you find, are you able to, obviously you're, obviously you're hungry and you're in a certain frame of mind during the day. Are you able to work? Does work take on a different characteristic? What, what's your... Uh, yeah, fasting. you you can work you can work as usual, but obviously, when you're fasting, you're kind of not as productive as you would be otherwise, right? So you kind of tend to most people tend to reduce their working hours mm -hmm. during Ramadan, and the pace of work is much slower in Ramadan compared to, compared to usual. So and which is expected, and so yeah, I tend, but I personally tend to kind of. And take calls and meetings after I break fast, after iftar, and in the daytime just like do the admin and, and back back office kind of work. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So what do you, you know? It's funny. The, the past few years, intermittent fasting became trendy in the West, in the U.S. You know, I I, I never used to hear about this stuff. The, we were when I grew up, the idea was you know three square meals a day, and you know we were, or you're supposed to snack healthy during the day. Now intermittent fasting. Or one meal a day, OMAD, is a big thing. And I was reading some books about it, and they're like, 
anyone who's afraid of this just needs to understand that in Islam, they've been doing Ramadan for an extremely long time. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, even no, no, inter intermittent fasting is very healthy. Yeah. It's very healthy for you. Yeah. Interesting. And the thing you're mentioning about the white blood cells, you know, and your body healing itself, autophagy is now being understood yeah. in the West. And of course, yes, yeah. Interesting. Do you are there resolutions that go along with Ramadan? Is there a sp specific reorientation that's formal or informal? Um, no, I think uh, people go about their business as they usually would, um, but I think usually people kind of socialize and spend time with family and friends after iftar, after the last prayer of the day. And usually people kind of socialize around iftar time or support time. So I think um, everybody's in that kind of, during the daytime when they're fasting, they kind of um, go, at, go at a slow pace. Yes. And then in the evening when they're not fasting, then they kind of, you know, eat, eat all the special foods that they like to eat. It's all in that whole month, you know, people make an effort to kind of prepare special meals um, throughout the month. And uh, people are generally kind of in a, in a positive mood, especially when they've broken fast. But they tend to be cranky during the day when they're fasting too. So <laughs> I, I noticed that. I'm, I'm, I'm moving all my meetings to the evening. <laughs> I, I know that, Welcome you know, to I'm, just, I'm an innocent bystander, but I, I am noticing that a little bit. I'm like, okay, you know, uh, I, as, I'm, as I'm learning the new life here in, in Dubai, Interesting. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that's not our normal topic, but it, it's so interesting. And you're no problem. You seem like an no expert. And you, you, thank you. Um, all right. Let, let's shift gears back again. So Shisha, Shisha Finance, t tell me about it. Yeah. So Shisha Finance, I founded Shisha Finance uh, April 2021. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to kind of, um, after I'd been in the space for several years, I thought um, I wanted to try out being an entrepreneur myself and um, well i mean for a second time if you like after, hey, hey, after hey, sorry, just, just so i totally understand you were doing alphabet before yes in the yes family? yes yes okay yes. And, and maybe just kind of repeat it for me what was the thesis behind alphabet what was it what, what was alphabet the... was an early stage crypto vc fund yes and um, regulated by the dfsa in the difc jurisdiction in dubai okay. um and it was basically to be kind of a regulated early stage VC fund. The fund is still operational, it's still running. I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day activities, but the team is managing the fund um, as usual, and it's seen great returns for people that have been um, LPs in the fund uh, since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of my first uh, kind of taste of being an entrepreneur. Um, but then uh, in April 2021, I, I decided to um, have my own startup and um, I wanted to create something that drew upon my experience in the space. And that was mainly being an early stage um, angel investor and kind of um, yes. advisor and uh, consultant to a lot of crypto startups. So I, I basically wanted something that would um, structure that in a more formal way and, and through an entity, through a company. Mm -hmm. um, and that was uh, what I wanted to do. And, and the idea of Shisha Finance when we first started was um, to be a tokenized, um, tokenized decentralized um, VC uh, portfolio. Okay. Um, and in the first, uh, the first year or year and a half, we invested early stage into uh, 40 different crypto startups. Actually, and then towards this for a second because you, you, you dropped something sure. really interesting in there that I'm struggling with, or maybe I'm seeing other people struggle with, which is you're there's been a lot of talk about tokenizing funds, not just investing in tokens, but tokenizing the fund themselves, having a blockchain based fund. I, I think yeah. uh, Brock Pierce was trying to do that with blockchain capital, or it, it, that's floated yeah. around a lot. And I think there's been some, I think there's been some successful cases about that. I, I honestly should know. Yeah, are, are, are yeah. I mean, it, there has been there has been successful cases of that, but with those uh, kind of funds, they basically tokenized the LP shares in the fund, right? Yes. Uh, with us, we issued. 
with us and and so the the token this it's a security token which is basically um completely linked to the lp shares of of people in the fund mm-hmm. and whereas with us we don't have a gp lp structure we don't have a management fee we don't have a performance fee and um, people who want the exposure to our portfolio would go out on the market and buy our token and that would have exposure to our portfolio because with the portfolio that we have, um, the returns and the profits from the portfolio circle back into the token itself. Mm-hmm. So that means, that's, and but because it's an early stage portfolio and the maturity is like around three to five years from when we started, now it's becoming more mature and we're seeing much more liquidity in the portfolio. So now the token should closely kind of track um, the portfolio value and the returns and profits of the portfolio. But we issued a token and against that token, we also um, put up a staking pool so people would earn rewards by staking our token, but also, and so they're getting a passive income and they're getting exposure to the returns of a portfolio at the same time. And they're not paying any fees and it's not done in the traditional way. And everything's on a smart contract. So everybody knows exactly how many tokens they have, which means, they can kind of approximate compared to the total um, total sub- token supply, you know what your percentage is. And if the portfolio returns, say, a million and you have 1%, then definitely you should be seeing um, a profit on that. So you, right? you actually did 10, tokenize Shisha it, it, right now? Um, or is we it have, but progress? the jury is still out on whether it is actually following the portfolio or not. But I think the token will reflect more closely to the portfolio in the coming months and years to come yet. Is it an informational issue? I think it's a it's more of a liquidity investing and lockup period that we have. Okay. So unlike an existing fund that's been running for a long time, once it matures, then you know kind of what is the expected returns and you see the liquidity there and, and there's no lockups. But with us, it takes, I think for me, it's always been a period of three to five years before we really started seeing seeing meaningful um, returns and performance on the portfolio because it's a very early stage portfolio. It's from an idea stage that we get involved with projects and we support projects from an idea stage and help them business uh, build a business model and have a revenue model and um, kind of structure their token and get that token to market and and all the things that they need that a startup needs to do to be able to launch a token and um, launch a product and service and and get to market, basically. So let's talk about that. As I was recently at one of the events you hosted. Thank you very much. And I don't know how much information to, to give away, but you had I think you had a gaming company in from Scandinavia, yeah. very interesting group. Yes. Um, how do you for Shisha? How do you find your portfolio companies? How do they find you? Walk, walk, walk me through that. Good, good question. Um, I think it's a combination of uh, founders reaching out, reaching out to us. Um, uh, and also we kind of uh, do a lot of research on a regular basis and we look at what's out there and we're, we're on a lot of um, kind of social media channels. So we look at what's coming out and what people are excited about or what they're looking at. And we kind of look for interesting projects in those areas but you usually it's mostly people that are coming to us um, and luckily because of my kind of background and my experience sure. and my network a lot of people tend to kind of get in touch with me and uh, or reach out to me on, on social media and um, you know I hear out their idea and if it sounds interesting and it has potential then we'll engage in further discussions and um, and make sure we're uh, Kind of, we share the same kind of vision and idea because we like to be active with our portfolio projects and to support them as much as possible, um, and definitely want to get along with them. So the inter- initial period and the due diligence period is important to kind of figure out if it's the right fit for us, if it's the right use case, and if it has um, the legs to kind of um, be successful in the future. So um, it's a combination, but mm-hmm. mostly it's been people coming to us. Okay, interesting. So you're setting up a beacon and it attracts their attention, they come in. 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. But we definitely want to be much more outgoing um, mm-hmm. in the coming months and the, and the next couple of years, and and put our name out there and do a lot more in terms of growing our community and and creating a re- awareness around what we're doing. I think in the UAE, in general, people tend to have heard about us, but it's outside the UAE and globally that we should be kind of um, expanding our network and talking to more people outside the UAE. Interesting. And then, Labi, when you're working with a company, given the tokenized nature of Shisha and the token, must they be tokenized in order to work with you or can it be a regular company doing uh, great technology? Mostly it's been projects that have wanted to issue a token mm-hmm. and that's great. But there has been a few cases where we've taken on projects on the equity side um, and uh, they're not issuing a token, but they're doing uh, something relevant to the to the blockchain industry mm-hmm. um, or have an angle, a blockchain angle to it. So there's been a few cases of that, but mostly it's been projects that have um, wanted to issue a token against what they're doing. Got it. And then it sounds like there's an, an advisory, it sounds like there's investment, but there's also an advisory that kind of goes along. Yes. With, if I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah. So uh, what happened was um, when we first started off, we deployed about 7 million USD into 40 different crypto startups, um, all at an idea stage. And mostly we've been the first tickets mm-hmm. um, in these projects. And then when the bear market fully kicked in, and then we pivoted to becoming more of a incubator accelerator. Mm-hmm. And instead of deploying capital, we would actually deploy our human capital into projects and support them with the people that we have. Mm-hmm. And in return for that support, we'd get um, tokens or equity or retainers against that. So it, we became more of a incubator accelerator consultancy shop sure. um, in the bear market. Um, but now we can think about us more of a venture studio where we would uh, be very early into a project. We would take a significant stake in the project. We would actually kind of be much more involved and we are going to be much more selective with the companies that we're working with. So, so far in a few years, we've got 70 companies in the portfolio, but I think um, we're going to focus on a really handful um, of projects uh, every year going forward because we have a really uh, good base of early stage projects and now we're kind of going to be looking more at um, growth stage startups which fits with the cycle or the stage of most of our por- portfolio companies now so we're tending to look at more rather than an idea stage more of um, startups that have uh, MVP or a service and they have some traction and they they haven't structured their token yet, but they have a business model in place and they have kind of users on and help them get to market with a token. If I'm hearing you correctly, the idea, your idea stage, early investment companies have grown up to be growth stage. And so if, in order the, to match them, the ones, any new ones need to be growth stage also, just so they're all sort of in one co. Yeah, we want to be we want to be doing the same kind of activities that's focused on the cycle of a of a company. So we've gone through the early stage cycles with companies and now mo- almost all of them are at the stage. So now we're you have to do different things and support them in different ways sure. and when it, when they're at this stage and we want to kind of replicate that with any projects we take on going forward. Got it. And all right, tell me about your team or tell me about your network and the resources you bring to bear. Yeah, so I have um, our chief operations officer, Nehid Shah. Um, He has a traditional finance background, operations background. I worked with him in Adia, so I know him really well. Um, We have Nathan Cooper, who's head of our uh, portfolio and manages the portfolio. Again, he was with me in Adia. He has a traditional finance background. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a chief risk officer, Adham Abaza, who I've known for many, many years. He was in the same school that I was, and he has a oil and gas kind of background and um, um, compliance and uh, kind of uh, legal background. So he's supporting on that side. We have Yuri, who's our chief technology officer, who's working on the tech side. He used to be in uh, Emirates MBD and heading up 
kind of blockchain projects there. And we have Hazar who manages our events. Um, and we have Abhishek who manages our uh, marketing efforts. So we have seven people. That's a good group. And then is 70 portfolio companies unwieldy or is, how, is it okay? I mean, that sounds like a lot. Um, yeah, most people would say it is a lot. Um, and that's why we are kind of slowing down on the number of projects that we have in the portfolio. But about from the 70, about 25 are already out there in the market and already doing their thing. And they're kind mm -hmm. of um, well drilled into what they're doing. So the level of support that they need isn't as much as it used to be. Um, but yeah, it, it is a lot and um, it, it keeps us busy. But we prefer to be active and, and we want to be as as active as we can be with uh, all of our projects. That sounds good. Um, do you want to tell me anything else about Shisha or life or blockchain or Ramadan or anything? No, I mean, uh, I think um, it's uh, exciting times at the moment with the market kind of really picking up over the last year or so. Um, and then I think um, the, the number of use cases that are coming out, the new use cases that are coming out is very interesting to see. I think um, real world asset tokenization is definitely something that's going to continue to um, take up interest, uh, especially from institutions. And I think the technology is developed enough now to support a lot of use cases, especially on the institutional side that maybe three or four or five years ago, the technology wasn't really there yet. And I think there's still a long way to go before the technology can actually like fulfill its potential and actually start becoming mainstream in the financial services industry. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's exciting times and um, um, people that have uh, been building over the last few years are um, really happy to see that the market's picked back up and there's a lot more excitement. There's a lot more um, people talking about crypto and Bitcoin and a lot more institutions getting involved in the space. So um, I'm really looking forward to the next few years. And um, I think we're very well positioned uh, with Shisha Finance to actually kind of um, really start seeing the rewards from the companies that we have been supporting because I think this is where they've all been, they've all been building over the last couple of years and now they're kind of starting to get their tokens on the market and starting to kind of grow so it'll be interesting to see how they uh, how they progress but um, I'm confident that most of them will um, do well um, and the future is looking very bright at the moment. That's fantastic. Well, you know, you're you're a good guy. I've known you for a while, and I think you'll be very. You are successful. I think you're gonna be. You will be extremely successful, and it's well deserved. You've put in a lot of time and effort, and you've been very consistent in your focus. You know, bear market, you, not bear market. You know, you, you, you and you chose your passion. I, you know, I, I go back to you sold everything about Bitcoin. I mean, that is good move, my yeah, friend. Yeah, I was lucky. I was lucky that I found. Uh... I found my passion and um, throughout uh, throughout my time in the space, uh, because of the nature of what I have been doing professionally, it's all been supporting uh, people, supporting founders, supporting projects at a very early stage and um, believing in them. And um, that's what I've been doing. And, um, you know, I, I just... Um, I do it because I love what I do and I also want to contribute to the ecosystem and the economy here in the UAE. And um, I've been fortunate to be one of the early adopters of mm -hmm. blockchain technology and crypto here in the UAE. And um, I always want to see what's best for the UAE. And if it means putting time and effort and resources and helping people that usually are surprised that I would actually give them the time and effort that's needed to help them. Um, but ultimately, everybody wins. Uh, and I see that um, if I do my part, then everybody benefits, not just myself. That's a great point to end on. Saeed Adamaki, thank you so much for the time. Ramadan Green, you're a good man. Thank, thank you. you
Thank you.